Learning Unit 1, Theme 2 of our Communication Science 1B, Intercultural Communication. I've attached a disclaimer just to please note that all content used in the slide has been used from our textbook and that all images have been accessed from Google and should be referenced by the IE Harvard Reference Guide. Our learning outcomes today is for Theme 2, Intercultural Values and Worldviews. We'll be applying Klakon and Stratbeck's value orientations to practical scenarios. We'll differentiate between Hall's low context and high context cultures. We'll explain Hofstede's value dimensions using practical examples and clearly discuss the possible limitations of applying cultural values and frameworks to different cultures. So theme two discusses all the theory related to our intercultural communication value orientations, as well as low context and high context in cultures and the different other value dimensions that can be added to this theories. Okay, there is an introduction on our page 70 of theme 2 where we're starting off with that you can read through, which is that within the cultures, what values would you choose? On question um, 1, they just give us an example to start off with. The top three values were accountability, honesty, and respect. So participants were asked to select 10 of the following values and behaviors that they'd like to see in the nation. So you guys can just read through all of that. And we're going to continue into our theory. So this is once again noting that culture does influence our communication. Within a cultural group, we tend to have a worldview, which is just to say um, how we see the world, and a communication style. The communication style will be obviously verbal and nonverbal, and through language we can portray our values. It's important to recognize that there are different communication styles and this will help us understand our cultural differences. Okay, what exactly are values? So we know what values really are from our past work and this is to do with what is judged to be good or bad, right and wrong, and it is a part of a belief shared by our cultural group. Values can be learned and relate to our outcomes and our behavior. It can guide an individual selection and evaluation of their behavior as well. And values tend to be arranged in the order of importance it has for that individual. So here we have some interesting cultural patterns on page 71 of table 4.1, such as that these are um, values that guide into the particular cultures here. So looking importantly to the highlights of some interesting cultural patterns from around the world, and how do these cultural patterns reflect cultural values? Irish are very proud of their histories. For another example is, um, where we've got here Zambia, time is informal and may be acceptable to arrive quite late. So here's some examples of cultures that tend to have these particular values. But as you can see, they are generalized. And it's not fair to say that everyone within the culture has the same value. But before I get into that, we're going to explain more with our first theory, which is Clackhorn and Stradbeck's value orientations. Hopefully you're still understanding um, what I'm saying, you're taking down notes. So, so far, you're just going to read through that survey on page 70. And we've discussed that within our culture, we do communicate our, in our culture. We're going to, culture does influence our communication. We have different communication styles. And we also, what exactly are values? We do understand what values are but sometimes they are applied to the entire cultural group. And it does depend on the individual, how they select that, val um, that value that they have and how it influences their behavior later. Clark Cohen and Starbeck, so this is gonna draw upon a theory. They had two assumptions, which is that humans tend to have some sort of problem, universal problems that need a solution. There is a range of possible solutions that are out there, but a cultural group would prefer one solution for their group. The solution that they choose to solve the problem they have is called a value orientation. So that is quite interesting. Your cultural group will most likely choose a specific solution to a problem, and therefore that will be applied to the entire cultural group and is known now as a value orientation. Do we agree with Clark Horn and Strabik's value orientation theory that when humans have a problem, they would mostly select one value, one problem, 
and the, it will apply, be applied to the entire cultural group? That's quite an interesting theory. So let's unpack that a little bit more in the next slide. So here are the range of values here that we can look at. So a person's need, before I start on to Cluckhorn and Strabic's value orientations, I just want to note that a person needs a rise from cultural values. Let's just say as a student, you have a need for privacy. You want independence. You want to be um, completely private, independent, make your own decisions. And one might argue that this is stem stemming from an individualism cultural group. And therefore, you fall part of that cultural group. Let's look into Clarkhorn and Strabic's value orientations here. Um, this is going into the slide of the um, the page on page seventy two, and I'm going to read out what Clarkhorn had said here. Specific patterns of behavior, insofar as they are influenced by cultural factors, are the concrete expressions reflecting generalized meanings or values. And to the extent that the individual personality is a product of training in a particular cultural tradition is also at the generalized value level that one finds the most significant differences. Okay. So our behavior and how we act is influenced by culture. The outcome of an individual's behavior is represented by the values um, and so on. So this theory is redefining that because we have these values, it influences the individual's behavior. So each cultural group would have one or two peripheral responses or so, uh, like kind of a solution to the problem, but it's not also taking into account the different differences among individuals. So let's unpack this table we have here. Clarkhorn and Stradbeck is saying that in the value orientations, we have five problems. What is human nature? What is the relationship between humans and nature? Number three, what is the relationship between humans and human activity? What is the preferred personality and the time orientation? Are people basically good? Mixture of good and evil, basically evil. Do humans dominate? Harmony exists between the two. Does nature dominate? With the relationship between humans, is it based on individual, group orientated, or collateral? Is the preferred personality doing, growing, or being? And in time orientation, are you future orientated, present orientated, or past orientated? So let's circle back to that first one. Human nature. What is human nature? Do you believe that people are basically good? Do you pe believe that people have a, a balance of good and evil? Or do you just believe people are evil, basically evil? We can relate this to in legal, which is that within the legal part of our um, society, should we punish or should we rehabilitate? When it comes to religion, in terms of the solution of being basically good, we would want to rehabilitate. And when it comes to religion, Buddhism believes in the basically good nature, the people are good. In the second solution, what would you say South African cultures? Do you think we're all basically good? Do you think we're basically evil? How do you think we operate? I think we operate then on the orientation of mixture of good and evil. We do believe that people should be in, imprisoned um, and punished in a sense in that way. But we do also believe in rehabilitation, that people should, you know, also get help and all those sorts of things. And then the humans are essentially evil. These are societies and cultural groups that believe that people are, you should most likely punish them, than rehabilitate them. And then that might also be reflected in certain religions that also feel this way. And just to ask yourself, do you believe, which value orientation do you believe in? Do you think people are basically good? Do you think there's a mixture of good and evil? Do you believe the people are basically evil? Hmm, quite interesting. Let's go on to the next one. The relationship between humans and nature. The humans dominate would be that we take over all the land. Um, nature must make way for us. Um, it also can relate to birth control, which is to not just allow nature to take over, but you control 
um, yourself and all of that. And then I think it was in Japan or some a part of Asia that they were using seeding of clouds to make it rain. So it's kind of acting in the way of nature and taking over in that sort of sense. Okay, the next one, harmony. Harmony will be incorporating nature within also the boundary of human activity here, that they we kind of have a good balance. Most also seen in the Asian Japanese culture is to have that balance of religion and a spiritual life. And then lastly, the domination of nature, which is to believe that we should make way for nature. And if there was some, say, um, you having all these houses among a river and there's a flood, you would just rebuild because that is part of nature and we wouldn't want to take over and we'll just repair our homes. And we could say here, and this is an example of the Hidden um, Hills fire, that um, nature had dominated in that instance and you just need to clear out. The relationships between humans. We really are aware of individualism, which is that is the value that you believe in the I identity. It's about me. It's about work. Um, it's about being accountable for myself. And the value is more on the individual than on the group. Associated with more American, European cultures. Where by contrast, we have the group orientated and we wouldn't really say collectivistic it is in the textbook but we'd say group orientated in terms of the value and this is to look towards your extended family and take care of the tribe or the team there and then lastly we have collateral which is shared with collectivistic and that is to believe that there is connection beyond um, the living and their ancestors even if they're no longer living, you're going to pay attention to that, such as the, the Day of the Dead or in African funerals as well. Okay. Moving on to page 75. And you can just read through those examples there. Preferred personality. Okay, so we have doing, being, and growing. So it does depend on the different personalities there. Being productive, keeping busy is doing, um, those who do, documents, time is my sort of thing. But it's basically to say that it's all those that are keeping busy and in a doing orientation, being productive, um, associated with careers such as physicians, lawyers, performers, and so on. By contrast, we have the growing which you would see building relationships and keeping relationships associated with Ubuntu. And also within the Japanese culture, it could also be seen as growing, which is be more spiritual and um, bettering yourself in terms of that orientation. Then we have being. Being is also important because it's all about experience. And that is to be a bit more present and is uh, the actual relationships and experience is more important. I'm going to read out this example here. It can be found in Central and South America in Greek and Spanish cultural groups, as well as certain ethnic groups. A Spanish student told us that his mother worked for an American company in Spain. The company was behind in production and asked the employees to work overtime, offering a good bonus as an incentive. So this would be someone in the doing orientation would want to do this. However, the company was surprised when all the employees turned it down, saying they would rather have the usual five weeks of summer vacation than the additional money. This illustrates there was more important to spend time with family and interact with them and just being with the, the relationships and the family than to actually do in the doing orientation. Okay, still with me? You still writing down your notes? Good. And then our last orientation here is orientation towards time. Okay, depending who you are, they're all quite different. Let's just start off with fun, the future orientation, most associated with Western culture, which is to look towards the future, think about your retirement fund, um, trying to plan, and the, the way of trying to save up money would be more future orientated, always thinking about the future would be that one. Then we have our, obviously our Let's go to present, which is to live in the here and now. This can be quite tricky because you might have a lot of debt and you might not be looking towards the future and planning, and that can affect your future. But 
you know, you could be optimistic about the future as well and a lack of concern in that sense. And then we have those that are present, they live in the here and now. And, you know, just, oh, sorry, we have the past. We look towards the past to influence their present and their future. And those that are past orientated are going to um, try to learn from all the history, the traditions and their ancestors to help with their, you know, decisions and their values. Okay. In European, they mostly, they say here, they emphasize on the past. History contributes to their understanding. But some cultures can also emphasize the present and the past, depending. Okay, so how do we feel about this so far? What value orientations would you choose? Do you believe that people are balanced between mixture of good and evil? Okay, that would be our human nature. Do you believe there should be harmony between the two? Do you feel like nature should dominate? Are you more individual orientated, group orientated? Or do you believe that they are more beyond like ancestors? Are you doing, being or growing orientation? And lastly, are you future, past or present orientated? And this is to say it's within your cultural group. What does your culture group tend to do? Do they tend to rely on the past to learn from the past or influence the present and the future? Um, do they believe that you should be a more doing, productive sort of um, orientation there? And what I'd like all of you to do is to look into your lesson plan and to read through that additional resource that can just also help our understanding of these cultures, as well as the worksheets. In the next clip, we'll be looking at Hall's differentiation of high and low context cultures.